Well, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ted Tagami from a company called Magnitude, and we've been working very closely with the U.S. Department of Education and uh, hey. thinking about career technical education pathways and doing the extraordinary, which after you talk to Dwayne Cecil and Professor Twiggs, you will feel that you can actually make it more ordinary. You will still be extraordinary individuals, but uh, I think you'll find that it is rocket science, but following the step-by-step -step kind of process, you can make it real. Uh, it takes some time, but uh, we're really excited about this opportunity. So today I wanna to introduce uh, our, our, our um, speakers in addition to Tyler, who as a student has, been, has an opportunity to do a, a quite a, a substantial uh, work on one of the first CubeSats to leave Earth's orbit and going into deep space. That's pretty amazing. And just in time here, also, I want to introduce my co-founder at Magnitude, Tony. Hey, Tony. And uh, so with that- Hello, uh, everyone. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so with that, why don't I uh, um, uh, at least introduce Professor Twiggs. Um, we basically got our launch into space uh, by meeting the professor back in, I think, 2014. Um, and we were out in the Black Rock Desert putting uh, simulated satellites up in a rocket. The precursor to the modern satellite, the 10 centimeter cube, you know, what we call the CubeSat, uh, really was uh, a can uh, in the volume of a soda can to just quick iterative design and making sure that could work. But the beauty of that slides right into a, like a, a high powered rocket. You can out in the desert, you could launch it up 12 or 15,000 feet in the air. And once that can set was ejected, its hang time was about equivalent to horizon to horizon pass. So I've got a shot of you, uh, uh, Professor, on this motorcycle way back when uh, going across the desert to pick up uh, our payloads and whatnot. That was a lot of fun with Intel Corporation. But from that, back in the late 90s, um, that original design, working with uh, Jordi Pugsiar down at uh, Cal Poly, they came up with this modern satellite, which now everyone talks about. And you guys even planned to design and build one. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Twiggs and and Dwayne Cecil. Dwayne, working with, uh, my goodness, your background, Dwayne, is anywhere from NOAA to working at NASA, really deep uh, research and uh, capabilities on the science side. So you've got engineering and you've got science and you have a student here. Tyler, the first time I'm meeting you, Tyler, so hello. And I understand that you're doing some amazing work here. So I don't wanna do too much of the introduction stuff. I wanna turn it right over to, to you because I know you have a lot of content. If, every, if you have questions uh, in the conference, please put them in the chat. We'll have a little break here, maybe 20 minutes in to see what questions folks have. And we'll do that again near the back end of this uh, conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Professor. Actually, I'm yes. going to go first. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> unless, unless you want to say something, Bob, I'm going to jump in first right away. No, you go ahead. Are you going to okay. start your presentation? All right, well, thanks for the introductions, Ted. And thanks for inviting us to, to share our experiences. <clears throat> And that's what we're gonna do for you folks. We're gonna share with you today, the steps that we went through to develop small satellite CubeSat programs at the high school level. And we've taken them from, from some very simple technology you're gonna to see today to we are leading the first ever deep space STEM mission and we're, we're manifested on Artemis One in fall of next year. And, and as Ted mentioned, Tyler's part of that. One of the, he's on one of the teams that that we formed for that deep space mission. So we're we're gonna I'll jump right into sharing some slides, but you're also gonna see uh, some of the very simple and and the more intricate technology that our students not only have have built and flown on on weather balloons, both uh, tethered or all three tethered low altitude and high altitude, but also uh, eventually on on satellites. So let me get some slides up here, and we'll. We'll get started. Okay, so you know who we are. We're Destination Space. That's our not-for-profit. We're, we're uh, headquartered in Western North Carolina uh, near this, the town of Asheville, and there's a reason for that. I'll talk about that when I, I start laying out how we develop. What is our strength? What are the requirements? And, and how are we going to use remote sensing to, to meet the objectives and, uh, from our strengths? So um, it's, a, it's a really a stepwise process and hopefully you're so close to turning in your proposals, you've got a lot of this already in your proposal. 
but you'll get a, an overview of our, our STEM programs. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our space camps, which we put on all over the country. We've had them in California and West Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, South Carolina. And in that space camp, we really, we call it satellite week. So you can imagine what we, what we concentrate on at small satellites. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end about the deep space mission, but we approach this in a stepwise process. I, I spent 31 years working for all three of the US government space agencies, US Geological Survey with uh, Landsat uh, NASA at NASA headquarters in the Applied Sciences Program. And, and NOAA is a Western, first Western Region Climate Services Director. So we looked at starting the STEM program here in, in Western North Carolina. Asheville, the NOAA Center in Asheville is the largest archive in the world of weather and climate data. And my background is I, I have a master's in engineering and a, and a PhD in, in geophysics, geochemistry. So I'm a, a climate scientist by, by practice over the 31 year federal career. And so being in Western North Carolina we're the largest archive in the world of weather and climate data are, and our backgrounds, all of us on the team in engineering and, and applied climate science, we knew that our satellite program was gonna be focused on weather and climate measurements. So what are the strengths of your schools? Are you an environmental school? Do you concentrate on meteorology, weather and climate? Those are the things that you've probably already defined for yourselves. And you've probably already defined what are the remote sensing requirements to be on a platform like a CubeSat to look at the objectives of, of what your strengths are. Uh, step two, you'll hear a lot from Bob and, and Tyler, who's one of our interns and he's still a high school student. But you'll see some things that he's already developed um, with his, through his experiences with us that uh, we're really excited about. But in step two, you, you develop, test, calibrate, and fly some simple prototypes. You don't jump right in, build a CubeSat, think you're gonna get it on a rocket and get it in orbit. There's a, a, a series of steps you go through and you'll see how we approach that. Um, in step three, so you if you fly this thing, even in the Earth's atmosphere, whatever it is that you've de decided was your strength and you've designed and to meet your requirements, uh, now comes the so what? What do you, how do you collect the data? How do you archive the data? And how do you analyze those data? And, and why are you doing that? We'll talk about that and the development of a ground station and the data analysis and science applications. And finally, Bob will come in at the end and talk about taking all of those experiences and lessons learned from those steps. And there'll be failures. Uh, I like to, in our space camp, which is a week long in residence space camp, I like to give the students a, a Yoda quote every morning when we start space camp. And the first one I give them the first day of space camp is, the greatest teacher failure is because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to fail. Things aren't going to fly. They aren't going to communicate, but you learn from that. And so Bob will talk about how we take all those lessons learned and then start uh, really thinking about a CubeSat that's going to have space hardened sensors and can, can fly in space. So I talked about our, our focus, our concentrations, weather and climate, wide destination space, um, because we, we have the experience in engineering and in applied sciences, uh, particularly in weather and climate. Why Western North Carolina, you can always already guess that. Uh, the largest archive in the world of climate and weather data are here and about 300 meteorologists in the NOAA building in downtown Asheville. And most of the people in this region don't even know they're there. And they're, they're meteorologists and, and weather scientists and and just really doing their job and doing their science and doing the application. So that's why Western North Carolina. And I have down here in the, in the right, another example, maybe your school is really strong in environmental curriculum. And you can imagine the schools in California that might be thinking about, or anywhere in the West, Oregon, Washington, with this fire season that we had, uh, you might wanna look in, into your requirement being an IR sensor. And how do you start simple and build into a space hardened IR sensor so you can you can really get a, a, a space-based view of, of conservation and, and fire management. Um, so for our space camps and for our deep space mission, uh, under this first bullet here, 
we we concentrate on on all of these factors that I've listed here, but I've underlined three of them because you're going to hear mostly about the three under the first bullet there: robotics and hands-on remote sensing, and how does that relate to a CubeSat? You'll hear about that from Tyler. Uh, small sensors launched on weather balloons. Again, you don't. It's very rare that a high school would have the funding and the technical expertise to build a CubeSat that's going to find a ride in space first time they do it. So you go through steps and you work, work, get your teams worked up to some expertise to be ready to do that. And we'll also talk about how you calibrate these sensors and some quality assurance and quality control and some data analytics. So you know our strengths and you know why we have those strengths. It's our, our staff and where we're located. And so what are the requirements to look at weather and climate and remote sensing? So we, we measure temperature, precipitation, humidity, barometric pressure, UVA, UVB for irradiance. Cloud cover is a tough one from remote sensing. That's that, that one's the ones cloud cover and, and um, aerosols really have the, the climate science community stumped. And by the way, because of the COVID pandemic, I'll just put this in there. Um, as climate scientists, we've always thought of, tried to think of ways that we could turn parts of the atmospheric system off so we could really look at how our clouds formed and where the, the, um, where the source areas for, for different aerosols and COVID's allowed us to do that. So in the first shutdown back in March on a global scale, we've actually been able to see a great reduction in CO2 in the atmosphere and in aerosols. And so there's some exciting developments coming in, in climate modeling because of the COVID pandemic in climate modeling. So there you have the, the, a stepwise approach that we've taken and wh why we took that stepwise approach and what we were working toward. Our objective is based on our strength and then we figured out what are the requirements? What, what, what do we wanna measure and how do we do that? So now Bob, Bob and Tyler will talk to you how we've gone from very simple robotics and, and weather measurements on a, on a remote sensing platform to some more, uh, more intricate, more technical measurements, and then how we move from there to, to satellite. So Bob, you're up. Okay. All right. Um... Let me uh, uh, let me go ahead and show you some things here. Um, one of the things that uh, that I uh, really like uh, about this, and I hope uh, hope my screen is it is it showing up there? Yes. yes okay. Sir. See that finger? Look at that finger. See that finger? That fingerprint's been in space. That's what I want to challenge all of you to do. Get your fingerprint in space. And the way to do that is you build a CubeSat. And before it goes, you put your fingerprints all over this thing. That's one way to do it. Okay, so where do you start? You know, folks, this isn't rocket science, even though we use rockets to get things in space. It can start really simple. And one of the first things that I want to show you here is a little thing called a jiggy. And what a jiggy is, I'm going to hold one up here so you can see the physical size of it. And you can see the circuit there. It's really very simple. It's got a little vibration motor on it, a light, a switch, and a battery. And we take these parts, and you can see the parts down the lower left. There's the battery, the printed circuit board. Things for little legs, the motor, the LED, and the resistor, and there's already a switch on there. And we make the things like you can see over on the right. Now, they, the parts that I show you here doesn't make that. So what you have to do is go to Walmart and pick up all those goodies where you can make your uh, jiggy look like that. The jiggies, uh, you put them on the table and they kind of run around. Let me see if I can, I hope you can hear that. Anyway, that's, that's the jiggy, and uh, that's one of the things that we build. Why do we build that? Well, first thing, it's fun, and you get to learn a little about electronic circuits, and the fact is, is you learn how to, to do um, soldering. So it's simple, and it's fun, 
And then the next thing that you're going to work on is you're going to take something like what we call a protoboard. And you see up on the le left hand corner, we just all we want to do is just hook up a diode and an LED and have that LED come on. So you're starting to get a sense of how things are put together. And then the second one there, you see he's got three LEDs. How do you hook three LEDs in parallel? Now we want to get a little more sophisticated. What if we want to blink an LED? Well, there's a little thing called a 555 timer down the lower left. You put on your circuit board, on your proto board, add a few little components to it, and you end up with a diagram of a circuit like is on the lower right, and that LED will blink and you can change components and change the blinking rate on it. So, you know, just even blinking an LED is, you know, it's pretty fun, but it's a, a challenge. And I think if you look real close, you found out I spelled challenge wrong there. So we'll go on to the next slide. <laughs> okay, now we want to do something a little more sophisticated. And we have a thing called a cricket sat. And our ultimate goal is to build something that can go into space to measure temperature and transmit that back. So we can build a cricket sat, a prototype on a proto board, and it looks like a mess like this, which it, which it really is, but that's the way to get started. And so, you know, again, to me, this is fun. I have more fun building these things. And the nice thing I like about this, if it's wrong, you can just move the plug wire around and get it right. But that's one of the things that Tyler and Austin help the students go through with something that's much more sophisticated than this. And so here is really a cricket sat. Okay, you're going to get data from space. And I wanted to show you, here's a real cricket sat. Let's see if I get it in the right place. And if I turn this cricket sat on, I got a little... Um, That's the tone that's putting out, and it just absolutely drives my dog nuts. But if you get a hold of a thermistor, you can hear the temperature increase. And if I spray it with a little cold spray, you can tell it goes down in temperature. So here's a really simple device that you can build that you can hook on a balloon, and it goes up in space, and you know, it, it's really fun. You wonder what the temperature looks like, and I'll show you some, some of that. So this is what you do. You take the balloon, like we got here, a party balloon, and you can see the little cricket set that the young fellow is holding there. You let it go up into space, then you have a, a, a radio receiver here like this to pick up the tone, and that's hooked up to your to your notebook computer and you can record the data here and you can see the folks here putting it together and down here you can see their their computer listening to it and what does the data look like well it looks like this and what would you expect is the balloon goes up over time the temperature goes down now here's a question for you what do you think is happening here after the low point well, you, it, does it get warmer as it goes up higher? What happened there is the balloon actually breaks and it starts coming down, so it gets warmer. So you've got to analyze this data and understand what it is, and that's the fun part of it. So this is real space data you can get down from a very simple device. Now I'm going to let uh, Tyler go ahead and show you some of the things he got, then I'll come back and show you a few more things. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Tyler, I think you might be on mute. You might want to tell them who you are, Tyler. So I'm Tyler. I'm a, I'm a junior in high school, and I'm an intern with Destination Space. I've been to two of the camps that were previously mentioned. And I'm in the last camp I participated in. We used the <coughs> jiggy bot and the cricket set because that was back when the camps were in person. But um, this year, kind of as a consequence of the COVID-19 outbreak, we had to um, transition to online or remote learning. And so we couldn't use the same soldering and the radio equipment that you needed for the jiggy bots and the cricket sets. 
So we had to make a new system that we wanted to have a moving robot. And we also wanted a, a data collecting device and kind of um, some ideal parameters that we came up with were that we wanted it to use a solderless breadboard and Arduino microcontroller and a bunch of like cheap available reusable components so that we could get them out in a timely manner and they wouldn't cost a fortune because like a lot of the existing technology that we could have purchased was way too expensive. So um, because myself and Austin, who is a STEM technology specialist, have previous experience using Arduino, we started development on a, um, a small rover and weather station. The, um, the rover is called Destination Automation, which is the one that I mostly focused on. And it uses a small 3D printed chassis that this only takes a couple hours to print. It's very cheap, a couple of dollars. It uses rubber band tires, it acquires minimal assembly. And um, it's because it only has two driving wheels, the front uses a, um, a half inch ball bearing so that it can drive around and steer and stuff. And then the, the, ro the rover is, uses an Arduino Nano microcontroller. We started out using an Arduino Uno, but we figured that we could get it, make, make it smaller and a little bit cheaper by using the Nano. It uses a motor driver and an ultrasonic sensor so that it can measure distance, to find like obstacles and stuff. Then it uses two um, small six volt hobby motors so that it can drive around. But the motors that it uses don't have like optical encoders or anything to actually tell where it's going and how fast. So there's like a large calibration period to, because the, the only parameter you can control is your direction, a very, very approximate speed, and just the time that you leave the motor running. So the challenge is to kind of calibrate it to turn precisely 90 degrees when it encounters an obstacle. And by doing that over and over again, and by kind of keeping track of when it did encounter an obstacle, it can, in theory, solve any 90 degree maze. So um, it uses, it runs on five AA batteries and we can code it in the Arduino IDE um, using C++ based coding. Um, and it's great to like learn about all this Arduino stuff because you're not limited at all to the projects that we've already developed. You can take the same parts and maybe some other cheap parts from online to make pretty much anything you want. And you can really get pretty complicated with it if you want to. And um, so some of the learning opportunities are, like I said, you get to learn C++ coding and you can familiarize yourself with Arduino, which is a very powerful tool to learn about remote sensing and just creating all sorts of fun electronic devices. And so you also get to learn a little bit more about calibration, kind of like how with the uh, cricket set, you have to like calibrate the thermistor and your sensors and stuff have to be all calibrated so that you can get what you want out of them. And then, so, so some of the things that you can do with this, um, with the system is you can create your own model using CAD modeling, which is a fun challenge, very useful thing to learn about. And one of the things that you can kind of try to include in your rover design is like mobile lab and like living quarters. And um, you can make, you can, even if you don't want to like develop your own different like chassis and configuration of components, you can just take the same robot that you build with the kit and you can just do different tasks with it like instead of solving a maze you could have it just drive around race we even threw around the idea of making like battle bots sort of out of them and so the um kind of online um configuration to like because we couldn't do the cricket sats was um this Arduino based um, weather station, which we called Destination Weather Station. 
Um, it runs off of an Arduino Nano, just like the Rover from before. The same breadboard, a few more wires, but it uses a BME 280 weather sensor so that it can collect temperature, humidity, and um, air pressure. And it also has a UV sensor so that you can collect UVA and UVB. And kind of like how the photoresistor, uh, the, uh, the thermistor on the Cricut set um, can change its own resistance based on the temperature around it so that you can kind of calibrate it to receive precise temperature. You can use this photoresistor that we put on it, which changes resistance based off the amount of light that hits it so you can calculate luminosity from it. And it also runs off of five AA batteries. We tried to make them use a lot of the same components to make it even more available and um, kind of show that you can use the same parts to do a lot more things. And then it just, um, there's the, uh, there's the um, um, data that you can collect with it. And using um, the temperature, humidity, and air pressure we can also get a calculated altitude, which makes it a lot, which makes the data that we can collect from it a lot more applicable. And like you can graph it out and um, get a lot of nice data from it. And so, what you learn by using the uh, weather station is you get to learn about Arduino libraries and using the serial monitor a lot more. And you get to learn about data recording and archiving because since it can run up, because it has such um, kind of an unnecessarily large battery bank, you can leave it running for a really long time. And the SD card can record a lot of data and you can import it directly into Excel to make all of the graphs and stuff you want. And um, it also has a lot of testing and calibration just like the jig, uh, just like the Cricut Sat and Robot. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Cecil. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne, before you do that, I just want to uh, remind everyone that uh, let's keep this interactive. I imagine you might be having some questions about the engineering design uh, or process or what have you uh, as your challenge comes up. It is just a, a, uh, a essentially an application, if you will. Uh, getting into the actual engineering, you can start at any time and really kind of keep that long view in mind. Just some a couple of quick variations. This is a board that was designed by a sophomore and junior in high school that measures air quality. These sensors on here are very sophisticated air quality sensors from a company called Spec. They went and took this prototype. You've got particulates and CO2 sensors and then, uh, and then these uh, specific gas sensors that measure air quality. They went to their local air quality district and these two students re received a, almost a $50,000 grant from the air quality district for their school district, which was phenomenal considering their age and level of expertise. Very little help from the outside world for them to do that. So your ambition is only limited by your imagination. Uh, and then of course, uh, for those of you that just want to get a program running, uh, as Tyler mentioned, the Arduino is a pretty universal uh, board that you can get pretty much anywhere as a microcontroller. Magnitude has a pre-built board with all of those sensors that were mentioned radio capabilities, GPS, uh, real-time clock, and uh, in addition to that, an accelerometer and a magnetometer. This enables you, if you want to get right to the science, to get started with that if you got some after-school program or what have you. So there's a really a wide selection that you can go in, whether you want something simple and quick or you want to go really in-depth. So make sure you're posting your questions, and we're going to pick those up if you've got any. So back over to you, uh, Dr. Cecil. You're muted. Nope. You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> so before I turn it over to Bob, I just wanted to add to something that, that Ted just said. We had a, a high school team here in Asheville uh, a couple of years ago that, that uh, decided they want to measure volatile orga organic compounds. And we have uh, Asheville's a, a town of about 85,000 people, and we've got 35 microbreweries. So uh, beer making is a is a big industry here in, in Asheville, and so they decided that they would go around to some of the the microbreweries and measure fault or organic compounds in tethered balloons over the the microbreweries. And of course, the microbreweries were really interested in seeing that as well. Plus, they put them on top of their cars and drove around town, and they launched them on tether balloons and 
free flying balloon. So now you've got through that uh, column of the atmosphere, you've got all fall to organic compound measurements. They're very inexpensive, easy to do, and not as expensive as flying on a rocket. So there's a lot of things you can do as you work toward designing and building a, a CubeSat program. Before I go into the so what, what do you do with the data and the data analytics, uh, Professor Twiggs is going to talk about taking the uh, weather station, destination weather station that you just heard from Tyler about and how that's a, that's a backyard weather station. We can fly it on a, a tethered balloon, but it's pretty fragile. I mean, you know, some of those wires will come loose. And so what we've developed is that same weather station on a flight platform. And so Professor Twiggs will talk about that. And now you can start thinking about students have a weather station in their backyard. Uh, we're, uh, Tyler's working on putting a weather station on the rover so you can have a mobile weather station. And then you can also fly it on, on balloons. So Professor Twiggs, you wanna, wanna talk about the flight hardware for a weather station? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, what I, uh, what I wanna do here is show you this is what the uh, weather station looks like here. Um, uh, you can see the light blinking on it. I've got it hooked up and uh, it's putting out data and I'll, I'll show you that. Uh, I'll get to it in, in just a minute here. Let me go through some of my, uh, some of my slides here further. Um, so let's see, uh, are my slides showing up? Yes. Okay, and this is uh, what Tyler was talking about, the components that he had. And uh, we built this one on a, on a proto board and it works. Now you're really starting to work with what I call real electronics. And here's what the, uh, the uh, PCB looks like. And it makes a more compact, rugged device that you can now do a lot of things with. And this is some of the data that I collected on it, leaving it outside for an afternoon. And you can see the temperature varying See, the pressure actually varied a little bit. I think we had a storm coming in of some kind or, or a high pressure ridge. And what I want to do is show you now, uh, let, me, let me do a new share with you. I want to show you uh, this little weather station running. And uh, what I hope you can see there is this is actually what is called the IDE. It's the way you program uh, this sensor. And what I want to do is I've got some code in here and I want to, let's see, uh, that didn't do it. Let me show you on this. What I wanna do is to, you can see it compiling, it says compiling sketch, uploading sketch. So I'm doing this in real time on my desk here. Now it's done uploading and then what I wanna do is I wanna display the data that's coming out of it. So I go to the serial monitor and now I have to, do a new share of the screen with you. Let's see right here. Okay, I hope you can see this. You can see the data being coming out. It, it's, it hit, takes the data every second. And if you'll notice there, there's altitude. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna raise this thing up about two feet. And I think if you watch it, you can see about a two foot difference in altitude. That's how sensitive this thing is. It is just really amazing. The other thing is, of course, it's got a light sensor on it. So if you look at the column on the right, I'm putting my finger over the light sensor and you can see the light go down. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow on the temperature sensor. And you can see that the temperature go up there. See, it went up to 78 degrees and you see even the humidity come up. So I got a little, a little humidity in my breath. But you know, to me, this is just the coolest thing. And from the fact that you've got this, this um, SD card on it to store the data and you can hook a battery pack on it, you can set it up for any sample rate that you want and measure all sorts of things. You measure it on a balloon. I thought, I haven't done it yet, but I want to go throw it in my car window out here in Texas and see how caught my car gets uh, during the day. So let me go back. And uh, the other thing that uh, I want to do here is after we've done that, I wanted to show you, this is a, the thing that we've got here now uh, that we've got here. Here is the transmitter. Now this is on a board. 
that you can put up in space. It's the one he's talking about. We have a GPS on it. Here's the ground receiver. So this really, as you can see there, is the beginning of a crickets or a uh, CubeSat. In this particular case, we're only sending down on it, but we can send a lot of data down and we could make that a two way. So you've really got a CubeSat here that you could practice with. And this gives you the basis of really doing something. And what you can do is work up to this point and, and test this, get this going. Now, if you want to start building a CubeSat, you've really got some background to do it. One of the things I'd really encourage you when you go to build your CubeSat, don't get too complicated. It's really important that you get it done and, and fly it. And I'll tell you, putting your finger up in space is pretty cool. So I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Dwayne. Okay, Dwayne, you're muted again. Okay. All right, now I think I'm unmuted. We're good. <laughs> okay, so do we have any questions before we go into, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the data analytics and a little more about calibration and then we'll talk about the deep space mission. Yeah, Dr. Cecil, we do have a question from Emma. What sort of material should the outer structure of the CubeSat be made of? Do you wanna answer that, Bob? Yeah, the... Uh... A CubeSat, uh, it, it, the best thing to make it out of is aluminum. And there's several different types of aluminum and we could get into more detail in that. One of the interesting things about the CubeSat is you make it out of aluminum and one of the things that you do with it is you do what's called allodyne it. It's gold coating that you put on the outside and it's very, very important because that's a conductive coating on the outside of it. And a satellite or a metal object that's flying in space, if you don't make it so that the charges can uh, conduct around on the satellite, you end up with it getting a high voltage on one side. And it's just like scooting around on the rug and touch, touching your cat and it takes the electronics out. But aluminum, uh, fairly easy to machine, but it is important to understand the electrical characteristics and the thermal characteristics of your CubeSat. And we can tell you about that. We've made all the mistakes that I think can be made. And, and, but there's some, some really good information that's out there now. If you remember when we started this in the, uh, around 2000, we really didn't have any information to, to know how to do this, but the learning curve has really been good. Lots of publications now. And there, here is a gold anodized Aluminum one unit cube set. Allodyne. Allodyne. Our allodyne, yep. One one unit cube set. This right. is a, actual flight hardware. There's nothing in it, no sensors in it right now, but that's a that's a cube set. So some of the things we do with the with the once we start collecting the data is we we really want the students to understand the difference between precision and accuracy. And so we stress that in everything we do in precision and accuracy and talk about outliers. One of the examples we give them is we give them a weather station in Florida that for 145, uh, it's a, a rain gauge for a, with the National Weather Service for 145 straight days, there was no precipitation. Does that make sense in Florida? No. And so we teach them about outliers and, and accuracy and precision. And it becomes really important when you start talking about calibration. You heard Tyler and, and Professor Twiggs both talk about calibration. What I'm showing here is solar irradiance over the record of, of what we know since we start, first started flying satellites and looking at solar irradiance with satellite data. So this started about 1975 and this plot here runs through I think about 2017. And if you look at this, you would think, my goodness, if, that's so, if solar irradiance varied that much, we wouldn't be alive here on planet Earth. We should be following the the monthly sunspot numbers at the bottom, the solar radiance should be the same kind of a curve. So what this is, is each, each of those alphanumeric uh, indicators on those, those data plots are a satellite. So these satellites are measuring solar radiance in different ways. They're all measuring solar radiance, but they might be using a different kind of sensor to do it. And so the data look like um, it'd kill everything on earth. I mean, it's just too much of a, 
a range of solar irradiance. So you have to calibrate this information to really start understanding a 40 year record of solar irradiance, which really helps us understand climate. So when you calibrate it, that's what it looks like. And so you have to think about that. If you're, if you're doing temperature with thermistor like we do, and now we're switching to using a, a temperature sensor through an Arduino mini controller, uh, how do how do those how do we calibrate those temperatures and how are we sure that they're both telling us the same kind of a thing? Um, now, if if there aren't any other questions up to this point, we'll talk a little bit about the deep space mission that we're leading. And and the important thing to remember here is that the students who are our deep space team started out with those little jiggy bots and cricket sats, and they've moved up to now they've. They've helped select and design the, the suite of sensors that are on, will be on Artemis One and launched into deep space. Mm -hmm. And as you might guess, we're focused on space weather. Hey, do I our sensor suite will be focused on space weather. But before I get into that, just want to see if there's any questions so far on, on how we develop that. But what we want to get across here is that it, you know, it's, it's very rare that you can go out and, and build a one U CubeSat right away with, with a high school program and, and get it flying. You have to do it in a progressive way. And, and that's really how the, the students learn and, and they start developing parts of your program. And that's, that's the real rewarding thing for us. Mm -hmm. No current questions right now, Dwayne, but just a reminder again, please put your uh, questions in chat. We'll answer those along. And if anything, uh, Dr. Cecil, uh, and it's and it's it's an extraordinary opportunity here that uh, Tyler and the other students are doing. How many CubeSats have been in deep space to this point? Zero by NASA, right? Zero. This is the first time NASA and there's 13 uh, CubeSats on on Artemis One, which is right. set to to launch in the fall of next year. There are 13 CubeSats on there, but 11 of those, as you can see on the bullets here, 11 of those are on lunar and, and asteroid missions, two are in deep space, and they're actually in a contest against each other. And go. so it's it's our students and University of Colorado that are in, um, and our students are working with Miles Space in Tampa, Florida. And Miles Space is a small startup private uh, endeavor, and we're on the Miles Space CubeSat. I guess what I want to reinforce, if I can, is sure. that if you're listening now as students, you're right on the very edge of discovery. We've had uh, operational CubeSats in low Earth orbit for a number of years, thanks to Professor Twig's work and the work of other universities. And now we're seeing high school students do it. But now, we're just now starting to see the preparation for CubeSats to go into deep space. And that includes, let's say, missions uh, to the moon, to the lunar surface. So if you're getting started now, whether you're a freshman or a senior in high school, over the next half a dozen years, this will become a little more commonplace. You guys are at the vanguard of what's happening. So just keep that in mind. It's not like it's been around for a hundred years like the automobile. This is a yeah. fresh, new, open opportunity for science and engineering investigation. So something very exciting. Yeah, That's apparently. a great point. That's a great point, Ted. And, and I can't see it on my screen, but hopefully you can see the uh, the little billboard down on the right hand side of this lower right hand side of this slide that you are the Artemis generation. The students now are the Artemis generation. And a couple things that Ted said, said there are very important. Uh, this deep space STEM program is the first time to our knowledge anybody's had deep space STEM mission. And I already mentioned it is the first time that NASA's launched to deep space. And once we're launched and the power is turned on to our CubeSat, uh, we will fly in and we're going to boomerang around the moon. I'll show you that here in a minute and fly for 200 days into deep space collecting data. And those data, our students are working on those data now based on what they've already done in, in the atmosphere, not, not even in space, what they've done in, in the atmosphere with, with weather balloon launches and, and with drone launches and, and in situ on the ground sensor suites that they've designed and, and built. They've learned a lot of data analytics and a lot of quality assurance, quality control. So they're already putting together their data analytics packages, getting ready for when that deep space data starts coming in. So they'll fly for about 200 days, then um, NASA will turn off the power to the spacecraft and it'll continue flying on to space and they'll 
allow us to collect data for up to a year. So once this launches, anybody that wants to participate in this program will have access to these data. These data are for any, any STEM program that wants to participate in it. And you can see under the student involvement that we looked, we started out, it's gonna be a three-year intensive program and Tyler's part of this being a junior and he started a couple of years ago. And so he started a little bit earlier than some of the students that are in the program now, but we would like to have the students be able to work on this program all the way through high school from conceptual, getting ready for it, developing the data analytics, conceptual stage, to helping design the, the sensor suite to actually um, analyzing the data and reporting the data. And you see that I've underlined here as assess the CubeSat, assist the CubeSat engineering. Tyler's brother, Austin Bladura, who has been with us since our first space camp in 2017. Austin is now a junior at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida in engineering physics and working with our partner in this deep space mission, Miles Space, that's I mentioned it's a private company in Tampa Bay or in Tampa. Working with them, he performed a, a, a finite element analysis of the thermal and mechanical stresses on our spacecraft that we're flying on. And he did that analysis as required by NASA, turned that in and we found out uh, about a week and a half ago that NASA fully approved and accepted his report and his thermal, uh, his thermal and, and mechanical analysis of the stresses on our spacecraft. And that becomes a permanent part of the record of this mission, of the Artemis I mission. And now this is a, a student that started doing this work in high school with us, is in university now, and, and that's quite an accomplishment. That's, so that's why I, I underlined that there, that we give the students the opportunities to be involved in, in every part of these missions. And just like us in things that we do in our life, there's successes and failures and they learn from it. And this is one of the successes. So they, um, of course, being uh, a weather and, and, and climate focus, uh, where our students will be conducting experiments in space weather. They'll track the launch and flight in real time. And Tyler is actually building two 3D models of our spacecraft. And it's, I, I showed you this 1U uh, CubeSat and these spacecraft, all 13 of them that are on this mission are 6U. So you can imagine it's about the size of a desktop computer, six of these together. And ours has, oops, sorry about that. Ours has solar panels on, on the top and the bottom that will open up once we're launched. And Tyler's building two uh, 3D printed models of those. And we'll use those. We're gonna put one in the Asheville Museum of Science and have a touchscreen monitor and a computer there that, that students and children that come into the museum can see in real time where this satellite is and, and touch the touchscreen and we'll have uh, pre can programs and data analysis for them so that they can in real time look at the data. And, and Tyler's one of the students that'll be working those, those presentations up. And so we let them do that. You know, we, we, we give them some opportunities and they come up with the ideas. And of course, they'll be analyzing all the data from the onboard sensors. Uh, I mentioned the launch. Uh, these uh, yellow stars on this cartoon are what are called bus stops, and there's five between Earth and the moon. Originally, we were gonna launch from bus stop number five and slingshot around the moon and into deep space. But based on, uh, again, some of the work that, that uh, Tyler's brother Austin did, and, and of course, a lot of others, NASA's did some uh, thermal modeling and determined that they want these CubeSats to launch instead just after the Van Allen belts at bus stop number two, because they feel like as they get further out uh, into space in the moon, there might be some, some thermal impact on battery systems. So we're gonna launch at bus stop two, but we'll still follow this, this launch path and, and uh, slingshot around the moon and then off into deep space. Uh, I mentioned mile space there, and there you see the, the 6U, a cartoon of the 6U CubeSat up on the left with the solar panels opened. And the end that is facing us is where our students have their one U. So you can imagine a half a unit wide all the way across the end of that satellite is where our student uh, sensor suite is. Oh yeah, Tyler's showing you there. Uh, so go ahead. I was just gonna say there's a couple of questions here. I think you might've already answered this, but just to refresh, if you could bullet point, 
the uh, what data is your CubeSat collecting from deep space? Okay, I'm going to get to that. Okay, wonderful. And then there's another question about living organisms, but I think we'll pick that up. Some work that we do aboard the International Space Station that Georgia, you asked, so we'll answer that at the end. But go ahead, uh, Professor. I'm a Dr. Cecil. Okay, uh, I wanted to throw this uh, rocket and Terry's rocket launch from Wallops Island in here. Uh, we had in April 17th of last year, there were, I think, 60 schools and universities from across the United States that had small satellites that Professor Twiggs really was the, the brainchild behind them called ThinSats. And in these ThinSats, we, we hope to get a five day orbit. Uh, we didn't quite get that because of, uh, we launched off of the, the Northrop Grumman rocket just as the rocket was turning. And so I put our little ThinSats into, into a spin and we didn't get a full five day orbit. But these were on our team in North Carolina, we had um, six, we had schools from six states on our North Carolina team. And in Kentucky, we had three elementary school students. And so they went through a year long process where they, uh, just like in our space camp, and just like we described here today, they started out with jiggy bots, and cricket sats, and launched them on balloons. And, and then they used uh, sensor suites on little things called flat sats, and actually then moved on up from high altitude balloon launch in phase two, to this is phase three. And I just wanted to show that rocket launch here. And so there's there's a lot of programs out there that if, if and we hope you all get through this com competition and get awarded. But if you don't, don't don't just shelf your ideas. There's lots of programs that you can get involved in and, and use your ideas and, and we can certainly help you do that. So this is a, a, a cartoon showing the launch of those thin sets last April 17th. And they are released from the second stage of a supply rocket headed for the International Space Station. And so they're released at about 150 miles in, in altitude. And so I, I heard Bob call this, uh, and, and as I understand it, there's a lot of people that call this part of the uh, of space, the um, it, it's extreme low Earth orbit, but it's called the ignorosphere because rockets fly through it and satellites are above it. And nobody's taking any measurements in there. And so these students are, are taking measurements in, in what's been ignored. So it's been called the ignorosphere. There's another mission like that coming up that, that again is, is all students. And that's from elementary school to university. So somebody asked about the sensors in the deep space. Here's our sensor suite. Um, and some of these have been descoped and I'll mention those. Uh, there is a plasma probe on board. There's two particle detectors, one inside for inside the craft, one for outside the craft. There's a grid eye IR sensor on board. The horizon sensor has been descoped. The magnetometer is still on board. Unfortunately, we had to take the micrometeorite detector out to get a, a camera that Miles Space needed in. So the micrometeorite detector, I really would like to have seen that one. And then we also have gamma ray sensor and uh, UV sensors on board. And something that I, I really insisted that we add is electron flux sensor. NOAA has an electron flux model for the continental United States that they use in weather forecasting every day. And so our students are using that model to, to see how they can model electron flux across the continental United States. We have heritage missions that have done electron flux in extreme and, and low earth orbit, but we've not had electron flux measurements in deep space. And they're really important in, in understanding deep space, and understanding space weather, not just weather on the earth. So we have an electron flux sensor on board as well. And Dr. Cecil? You've yes. got a little nomenclature in there, uh, and I know what it is, but I want to make sure the students understand TRL, technology readiness level. Right, technical, ready, technical yeah. readiness level, right. And so, so that. Bob, you want to talk about that? These are your sensors, the UV and the gamma ray. The whole process of going from like one or two all the way up to nine. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, yeah, the uh, TRL level is uh, something that NASA set up, and it's uh, the uh, amount, the readiness of a particular sensor and how much experience they have. When you actually uh, are ready to fly a sensor that is qualified, that's a TRL level nine. And um, but most of the time, when you've got a, an experimental sensor, it's probably seven. But you've had some real experience on that, so. Uh, that's the way they rate the components that uh, you're going to use on a particular spacecraft. 
Wonderful. And the reason why I brought that up, some of you may be ambitious and want to design your own sensor. In fact, all of you are pretty ambitious, I imagine, once we have a chance to speak with you. If you build it, you might want to test it. And whether it's on a high-powered rocket here on Earth or something like a, a, a balloon that gets into the stratosphere, just by sending it on missions, you will raise that TRL rating. You will understand what it's capable of in temperature, extreme temperatures or pressures or radiation. And as you move it up, uh, perhaps it can even be flight qualified. So there's a process. You don't want to put something that's never been experimented before into space. And so you're going to need to go through everything that Dr. Cecil and Professor Twiggs has mentioned in order to get that design you have in your head for a new spectrometer or whatever it might be uh, to ready to fly. So just want to uh, make note of that. As you look for equipment, you might find conventional off-the-shelf components, uh, which may or may not have a TRL rating. Great for testing and, and, and experimenting on the ground and learning how all these systems interoperate. But if you're actually going to put something beyond the earth, Make sure you're dealing with something that's going to survive out there. It's uh, pretty, pretty extreme. I'm glad you brought that up, Ted, um, for a couple of reasons. And I'll talk a little more about some of the some of the jargon here. Um, our spacecraft has it, it's not a, a human flight mission. Artemis One's not a human flight mission, but NASA there won't be any humans on board. But NASA's treating it like a human flight mission, and and the reason they're doing that is. The, the ring on top of the rocket that holds the 13 CubeSats for launch, on top of that ring is the Orion spacecraft. And so they're treating it just like there are astronauts on, on board the Artemis One mission. So we've had to go through extra safety testing and, and different uh, TRL levels because they are treating it like it's a, it's a human mission. And another thing I wanted to mention, I uh, talked before about our students are already developing from their experience they've had with these simpler balloon launch platforms and um, experience that they've had with the data analytics. They're already putting together the data analytics packages for this deep space missions. And the way they're doing that, you'll see on some of these, like the magnetometer, I'll use that as, a, as an example. There's flight heritage, heritage, the TSAT mission. We have data from the TSAT mission. And so our students are taking those raw data and putting together the data analytics packages now so that when they start getting the actual data back from this mission, they're all set and ready to go to start analyzing it. And there's some contact information. Uh, it has our, our email and our website. Please visit our website. It's like most people's websites. We're getting ready to, to launch a redesigned website, but there's a lot of really neat things there. And, a lot of information and resources, and we'd be happy to, to work with anybody and answer any questions and have your students come to our space camp or we'll bring our space camp to you. We, we really feel like because of the COVID pandemic that we have a new arrow in our quiver. When we first, we, uh, our first remote online space camp was in West Virginia for NASA's IV and V facility there in Fairmont, West Virginia, independent verification validation facility. And they, they check and verify and confirm all the software on every NASA mission. So they have a really important mission. And we put a space camp on there this summer and we thought we were gonna be there and be in residence, but because of COVID, we had to go online. And at first, we, all of us were a little bit um, reserved about trying to do that, but we bit the bullet, they wanted the camp. We had a lot of students that wanted to, to participate. So we put the camp on and it was a great success. We put another one on a couple of weeks later for Aerospace Corporation in Los Angeles for inner city youth. It was also a success. So now we've put that, that arrow in our quiver. We're gonna keep remote online camps uh, because we can re reach a lot more students that way. We, we love the, the team building and the interaction face-to-face -face in residence in college dorms is a great experience. But some schools are remote and can't do that. So we're, we're, that's something we've learned from the COVID pandemic that we see as a, as a plus. And there's plenty of negatives in this pandemic, but we see that as a plus. We can reach a lot more students. So there's our contact information. Contact any of us um, and, and speak with our students. They really have got a lot of experience and, and we're, we've learned a lot from them. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and again, if you, hopefully you're all going to win in this contest. But if you don't, 
don't shelf your ideas and don't shelf your teams and don't stop. There's a lot of ways that you can start flying some of your ideas and do your experiments and, and have your students learn. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Cecil. We're right at the top of the hour. We want to thank uh, you and Professor Twiggs and, and Tyler for joining us today. George, I didn't want to forget your question, so I answered it quickly in chat. The question generally was living organisms in, in a high altitude balloon. You get up above the ozone layer and you're going to get a higher dose of radiation. I mentioned Deinococcus radiodurans because it's the most uh, radiation hardened bacterium that we know. And so it may not see any effect at all, but if you take and do an AB with maybe a common bacterium uh, as well as radiococcus, uh, then there, you might find uh, uh, some interesting differences between the two. I don't recommend sending uh, like a mammal, in fact, we discourage it, or even something like a, a plant, um, unless you plan on trying to create a habitat where it can survive minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius. But the bacterium, uh, we've seen uh, uh, students fly. The, um, the uh, water bears, you know, uh, those are interesting. Uh, if you can desiccate them, their, their proteins are a non-crystalline structure and they can survive radiation in the vacuum of space and be rehydrated again and essentially walk around as if nothing's happened. So those are pretty interesting to check out those little guys. And folks, we've even seen uh, students fly seeds uh, into the atmosphere and while they've had a ground control set of seeds and then they grow them to look at differences. So if you wanna explore uh, the biological investigations, of course, if you do it in, in orbit, uh, that's gonna be much different than if you'd done it in the balloon because it's unlikely you're gonna be able to get your payload back. So you're gonna need to get some way to record that data when you're in orbit. But for now, if you have additional questions, please send them out. You have the contact info for, uh, for Destination Space and for us here at Magnitude. We'll be sending out a follow-up link, uh, both for the session that was on Tuesday, as well as a reminder for the session walking through the format uh, for your proposal submission. Next Tuesday, we'll walk through that. I'm really more of a bureaucratic process, but we wanted to open up to make sure we're thinking about all the different elements to ensure that your rubric had the highest score in those five principal categories. So until we catch up with you guys next time, you have a wonderful evening or late afternoon, and uh, we'll see you in space. So again, thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cecil. And thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.